Okay. Developing microservices is easy. But making sure that you build a reliable system is hard. It is, it's in fact very hard. So I would like to start by explaining you the problem that I would like to solve today. So this here is a, an example illustration of a microservice architecture with a handful of services. Each square represents a microservice and all lines are possible communication between them, meaning that one service may use APIs served by the other. So this here is the problem. In a microservice architecture, we may have an unknown number of smaller services working together as a connected system. And this type of architecture makes each individual service easy to develop, build, and deploy. But these services may or may not communicate with each other. And there is no good way of making sure that changes to application A does not change uh, behavior in any of the connected services. There is actually no good way of knowing which of these services are communicating with each other at all. Application A could, for all we know, serve data to all five of the connected services, or none. We have no good way of knowing. So the problem here can be extrapolated to this. How can I, as a developer, confidently deploy a new version of my service? I first started thinking about this when I started working as a junior developer three years ago. Because in 2015, I was hired as a consultant to work on an old monolithic application. And every time I made code changes, I could run a whole suite of tests, which gave me assurance that I had not broken any of the internal functionality in this application. But we were also starting to provide an increasing amount of external REST APIs, and I could never be certain that I did not break any of these external applications that was depending on this monolith. So in 2016, my team was given the task to rebuild this monolithic application into smaller and more manageable services. And while doing this, we realized that almost all of our existing tests were impossible to port. And now I was left without any certainty that changes to a single application would not have dire consequences to the system. So the question became even more relevant. How can I confidently deploy a new version of my service? So if we take a look at this microservice illustration once more, we can see that we do not need many services before such illustrations become very complex. Microservice systems can be composed of a handful of services, or it can, in extreme cases, be more than a thousand connected services, like we've heard from Netflix and Uber. So how can I, as a developer, ever be confident that I will not break any services if we have a thousand interconnected applications? So the real question is, how do we avoid dependencies in a system? And the answer to that question is fairly simple. It's API versioning. API versioning is a great tool used to decouple connected or dependent microservices that I hope that you all use in your current projects. And supporting multiple versions of an API makes further development possible by removing all the limitations that you would have from current users of your API. Unfortunately, we will risk having to develop and maintain a limitless amount of API versions unless we know when we need to create new and when we can remove old ones. So we're going to take at an illustration that shows the relationship between an API provider and its consumers. And when a provider service creates and documents an API, they are really creating a contract to any consumer that wants to use their API. And this contract states, this is how you as a consumer can and should use the services that I am offering. And when the provider wants to apply some changes to their service, it is their responsibility to make sure that any changes to the API don't break any consumers. The provider needs to make sure that they do not breach their own contract. So to decouple the provider from the consumer, we need to use API versioning. When a breaking change occurs at the provider, developers will need to create a new version of the API. But how do we know 
when we have a breaking change. One bad solution that comes to mind is that I could start an instance of the provider service on my development machine, and then I could run all integration tests from every consumer to that local instance of the provider. But that is dependent on you knowing how to find, download, and start every consumer that uses your application. So we need to find a better way of discovering breaches in existing API contracts. And a possible solution to that, to that is consumer-driven contracts. Consumer-driven contracts is a testing paradigm where providers of an API encourages consumers to write integration tests for them. And in return, the consumer can be certain that the provider will not make any unwanted changes to the part of the API that the consumer is using. Consumer-driven contract tests are exactly like uh, old regular integration tests, but they're uh, instead runnable from the provider side of the equation. So this illustration has so far described the relationship between a provider and a consumer as unidirectional from the provider. But to have a healthy relationship between these two applications, we need to expand it to also include consumer contracts. And when a consumer writes consumer contracts, they are essentially telling the provider that this is how I am using your API. So the provider will now have access to information about which consumer is using their application, which endpoint or parts of the API they're using, and how they're using it. And this is essential information to be able to reduce the number of API versions and to ensure stable services to the consumer. And with consumer-driven contracts, all of these questions will be answered. But how can we do this in practice? Well, we can do it by using a framework called PACT. So it's a framework for implementing consumer-driven contracts to, uh, in your application. And PACT makes it very easy for consumers to write these consumer contracts, or PACTs, as they call them for short. And it does so because it has multi-language support for creating PACTs. And this means that you can write PACTs the using the same programming language as you already do in your applications. PACT currently supports languages like .NET, Java, Scala, Kotlin, Ruby, Swift, JavaScript, Go. So it's really versatile. PACT is also language independent during the verification process. And this is great because it lets consumers who write their application in .NET write integration tests in .NET or PACT in, in .NET, even though the provider is written in Java. And it's easy to share these pacts between consumers and providers, since Pact has created something called the Pact Broker, which is an application that consumers will upload their pacts to, and where providers can download them when they need to verify pacts. So now I'm going to do a code demo and show you how we're going to do this in practice. So the first thing that we want to take a look at is the API that we're supposed to implement. So uh, this, we have one endpoint, only one endpoint. It's a post to the path version one and uh, person. And uh, we send in a person object. And then I store it to the database. And I, I assign it an ID. And then I return the person object back to the consumer. And with the response status of uh, created, so 201. The person object, it has an ID field, it has a name, it has a social security number field, and it has an address. So when I want to create a pact, I, what I do is I create the object that I would like to send. So I'm creating a new person. And then I say, uh, by using the consumer pact builder, that I am the consumer application called pact consumer. And I have a pact with the, the application called pact provider. And then I give the pact a name. So I, I have named this, uh, this pact create new person request. It should be a request to the path of, uh, version one and person. It should be a post. It should have some headers. I want to uh, state that I'm sending a JSON, uh, JSON data. 
and then I want to send the person object. And then I say that when I uh, send this request, I expect the server to respond with the following. So I wanted to respond with the same headers. I want the HTTP status to be 201. And then I want the body to look like this. So I'm saying that I want uh, to have a string value for the field name, and that should be the same name as the person object I sent in. I do the same for the social security number. I expect the social security number to stay the same. And then I also say that, and I expect an integer type to come back for the field ID. So I don't know which ID that the, data, uh, that the service will assign to this person object, but it should have an ID. And then I just create the pact. So uh, for this demo, I uh, said in my application that when I build my application, I will also push the pact created to the pact broker. So now I can go in and I can do a Gradle clean build. Oh, sorry. Uh, project, projects, pact, pact, consumer, Gradle clean build. So we see that the packed publish task was successful, and we published the packed consumer to packed provider file to the packed broker. So now we can take a look at the packed broker. So I can update, and I now see that I have a pact from the consumer to the provider. And I can take a look at this pact, and it has the same field. It's opposed to the version one slash person with the person object that I created. And then I expect the server to respond with 201 and with a body containing an ID. So now we can go to the provider application. And we can take a look at what I need to write, uh, the code I need to write to just do a simple pact verification task. So this is everything you need. I'm saying that I am the application called Pact Provider. I want to get all my packs from the Pact Broker at localhost and port 3000. And then I'm starting a test target. So what we need to understand about uh, contract tests is that they are live tests. So what I'm doing here is that I'm saying start the Spring Boot application and then fire live requests to that instance. So I'm not working on dummy data. I'm actually working uh, with a live instance of the application. So now I can say that I want to run this test. So now we're starting the Spring Boot application. I'm pulling all packs from the pack broker. And the pact was OK. So the test was green. So we see that I did a uh, verification of a pact between pact consumer and pact provider, create new person requests. Uh, it had a status of 201, and it had a matching body. So everything is OK. But now I'm a developer, and I want to cr make some changes. So first of all, uh, I hate abbreviations. So SSN does not make any sense to me. I want this field to be called social security number. And just to make sure that everything is OK, I will just do the pact verification test once more. So again, we're starting the application, pulling all the pacts, and firing live requests to the application. And now the pact fails. And why does it fail? Well, of course, because the, it says that the SSN field cannot be null. I just renamed that field, but my consumer expects that field to exist, so something is wrong. So I still hate abbreviations, so I will just say that uh, during the serialization and deserialization process, I will just map the field from social security number to SSN. So now I can rerun the verification. And everything is back to normal. But I also have a problem with this field address, because that's a string. And that does not make any sense, because an address is much more complex than that. So what I want to do, I want to create a new class called address. And I want this address to have two fields, private string street name and private string zip code. And now I want to change the data type of the address field to an address. 
And I want to rerun the packed verification task just to make sure that everything is still in compliance with what the consumer expects. And everything is fine. But why is this fine? I just changed the data type. Well, if we take a look in the packed broker again, we can see that the person object that we are sending in only contains the field name and social security number. And the response that the server should respond with only need to contain name, ID, and social security number. So since my consumer don't care about the address field, and this is my only consumer, I am free to do whatever I want. So what we just saw now was that I could actually make a change, discover a bug, and fix it without ever having to uh, deploy to a test environment or do any complex testing between two applications. I actually discovered the bug without uh, deploying. So that was the short code demo. I have one minute of um, just some final thoughts. So what should you have learned from this presentation? Well, first of all, testing microservices is not, is not an easy task. And neither is having a reliable user experience when using a continuous deployment strategy. So make sure that you, as a provider, document your API well and that you have API versioning if you want to make changes to existing services that will break the consumer. And make sure that you, as a consumer, communicate your expectations back to the provider because consumers and providers need to talk to each other. And consumer-driven contract is a great tool to use to communicate your expectations. And confidence is the lack of risk. If you know everything there is to know about every line of code in every microservice, you would not be afraid of making changes to that code because you would know how that change would affect the whole system. But most developers don't know this. So we need to find something that helps us remove the risk of applying changes to a service. And consumer-driven contracts gives you information about who is using your API, which endpoints they're using, and how they use the data you provide. So by using consumer-driven contracts, you remove a lot of the risk of updating your service because you now have the ability to test that you still provide what the consumer expects. The code demo that you just saw can be found on my GitHub. That's github.com slash steamo with a zero. And if you have any questions, you can reach me on Twitter. You can send me an email. And I'll be by the stage after all the sessions are done if you want to come and talk to me right now. And thank you so much.